Again, a very good morning to one and all. I am so glad that you are here today for this panel discussion. I am Shreya Gautam. I am a journalist working with Daily Brief right now and I will be moderating the panel discussion today. So, as the global travel community is gathering here today, we are diving into the topic that is more than just a buzzword right now, sustainability. As the travel industry booms, sustainable tourism practices are also being adopted to balance economic growth with environmental conservation and cultural preservation. Our panel today will explore these practices and how they are a win-win for both marketers and the local communities of that particular destination. So with great pleasure, I would now introduce you to our esteemed panelists, starting with Mr. Mohammed Basam Adam, the Deputy Managing Director of Visit Maldives, MMPRC. Please come on the stage, sir. Ms. Kari Sanima, the Chief Marketing Officer of the Department of Tourism in Bhutan. Mr. Bjorn Bender, the CEO of Rail Europe. Mr. Rob Thompson, Head of Regions, Tourism Fiji. And lastly, but of course not the least, Mr. Sanjeev Sarangi, the Chief Fundraising and Partnerships Officer of Indian Grameen Services and a distinguished member of ICRT Foundation. Just taking my seat. <laughs> so much for joining me here today. I hope we are going to get a lot of insights on sustainable tourism today. So, starting with Mr. Adam, could you tell us a bit about the successful initiatives in the Maldives that are balancing tourism with marine ecosystem preservation? Yeah, Maldives has been practicing sustainable tourism from the beginning. So, it has been, last year was the fifth anniversary of tourism to Maldives. So we have adopted one island, one resort concept and EIA has to be done to each and every resort. So Maldives is already well, well known as a sustainable destination, especially when it comes to other industries such as fishing. We practice the most sustainable method of fishing, online fishing, where tourism, tourism also is currently involved. A lot of tourists visit Maldives to practice this type of fishing. So Maldives is well known sustainable destination and there are more we can still do. Thank you. So any suggestions or practices that you are planning to take up? Any initiatives that are in the works? Yeah. Uh, since we are diversifying our tourism into different industries like sports tourism, medical tourism and etc. Our focus is to adopt these new methods of tourism along with the sustainable plan. So that is ongoing in both Really excited to see what's in the works. Uh, coming to Ms. Neema. Hello ma'am. How do you promote Bhutan's cultural richness while preserving the landscapes and unique lifestyles, keeping in mind the gross happiness index? Okay, so um, Bhutan was the world's first carbon negative country and still remains one of the only three carbon negative countries in the world. So we're really blessed with this beautiful, uh, pristine, sustainable destination. And sustainability is like an a really intrinsic part of the guest experience um, and of being in Bhutan. So as you probably know, um, Bhutan has what's called a sustainable development fee. Okay, so the SDF. So this is a, this is a fee that all tourists and all visitors to Bhutan make. And the fee is $100 per person per night. And this is, doesn't go towards your food or your accommodation. This is just going into a kind of pot of money that funds things like free healthcare, free education, and all the sustainability and conservation projects that Bhutan does. 
So sustainability is very, very much part of the guest experience and it's a, it's a cycle. So when people come, they are investing into that pot of money that then funds more sustainability and conservation projects. So it's making sure that the benefits from tourism actually reach the whole community and not just the stakeholders in the tourism industry. So um, just addressing the last part of your question about the guest experience, um, there are so many guest experiences in Bhutan that are all about sustainability, I mean hiking, trekking, but when you visit Bhutan, it's a, it's a chance to kind of sit there, breathe, relax, maybe have a transformative moment and appreciate this beautiful nature, beautiful environment. Of course. Uh, so coming to Mr. Bengal, the carbon footprint of rail travel is one sixth, about one sixth of the air travel. So, are there any challenges that rail Europe is facing in promoting the sustainable mode of transportation, or is it at par with the air travel in Europe? So, before I answer to this question, let me let me quickly um, share who we are. So, we are um, the biggest global train booking platform when it comes to European train travel and we are combining more than 200 rail providers in Europe on one platform for B2C, but for, Indian, for the Indian market, mainly for B2B. And let me also express that it, it's a real pleasure to be here because it's such a vibrant event for me. It's a wonderful venue. And um, India got our second largest market for rail Europe um, last year. So it, it's a really, really good opportunity for us yeah, with our local teams based here in India to reach out to our GSAs. So when it comes to rail travel, of course, we do have the different perspectives all around the globe. Um, when it comes to sustainability, entire Europe yeah, is talking only about sustainability almost. And I'm very happy that I'm the representative of, of Europe today on this panel. Um, because, of course, rail travel is, is already quite well developed in Europe, yes. Um, I would say it's a completely different perspective, air travel and rail travel, when it comes to domestic travel and also cross-border travel. Um, in Europe, it's one-sixth of the carbon footprint, absolutely yes. Um, and uh, what is happening in Europe is that the European Union, the states are investing heavily into infrastructure, into rolling stock. You can see more of us almost every day. And maybe what are the blocking points is more the complex um, complexity in the system still, because we do not have yet one European rail system. You do have different um, nation, um, different um, domestic systems divided, separated. So you have different tariffs, different fares, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, it's all about really reducing complexity for Europeans, but specifically for non-Europeans traveling to Europe and making really train as the most preferred way of traveling uh, in Europe. And, and this is a lot of education, a lot of training, because of course, uh, when you compare maybe the rail circumstances, they are not, as I said, uh, equal um, in, in the market, specifically outside of Europe. Um, so it's a lot of really emphasizing people how easy it is at the end yeah, to, to even um, travel cross-border in Europe. So I'll ask a follow-up question, actually. Uh, air travel is generally uh, associated with, you know, a better way of transportation or, so to say, luxurious travel compared to rail travel in a lot of parts of the world. So, how do you think we can make rail travel come at par in other parts of the world? So, so, first of all, um, travel is a human need. Huh? It's related to emotions. We want to see our friends and families and relatives. We want to discover different um, regions on Earth. So this won't stop. Huh? And um, I guess it won't only not stop to travel by air, and that's completely fine. Um, it needs to be, um, I would say, the right mix at the end. Um, it needs to be um, comfortable, as I said. It needs to be um, convenient. And um, it, is, it, is, it is specifically, I guess, the society discussion what we have currently. You know, when you look, I don't know, in social media and you see all the discussions around Taylor Swift, for instance, uh, and all the private chats and so on. So there's a lot on, ongoing, let's say. And this will, of course, change. And the younger generation is looking for more sustainable ways of traveling. And, and I would say specifically for Europe and also other parts of the world, we are far behind that it is cool or sexy to be in an aircraft. Huh? 
Today it's cool to travel by train in Europe actually, and it's a bit of flight shaming when you need to say, oh my god, I traveled from A to B in an aircraft. Huh? So um, this, is, this, this is completely changing. Yeah, um, but it's a lot on us, on the industry, to really reduce the accessibility barriers. Huh? And they are, they are still high. And um, that's the reason why we need to do a, a fabulous job with you guys actually, yeah, to promote destinations, packages, hotels, combined with air plus train travel. Yeah, and of course, a long haul flight will remain a long haul flight. Yeah? All right, definitely the conversation around sustainable tourism has been started. We are part of that right now. Uh, coming to Mr. Thompson, what innovative strategies has tourism Fiji adopted for sustainable tourism and community well-being, specifically local communities? Sure, sure. Conscious I'm following, uh, you know, with a destination that's all about long-haul flights from India. Um, in saying that, though, uh, Fiji Away the National Carrier has um, begun the process of sustainable fuel and looking at what that means for them and how we factor that into into um, sort of offsetting a little bit of that, the fact that we are an island in the middle of an ocean and, and most of our tourists come in that way. Um, in terms of innovation, I'm, I'm not sure that there's anything specifically innovative. I think um, the benefit for us really, our industry is quite diverse and a lot of our industry was already um, going down the path of, of joining programs and following criteria before we really came in with a concerted effort. Since COVID, um, uh, we've hired a sustainability officer, which was a big move for us. And really, she and, and our chief operating officer have been really busy trying to work out how we can best approach this without you know, um, going down the path of greenwashing, if you like, and, and doing this in a meaningful way, and also providing uh, criteria and guidelines for the industry and, and some of the properties and um, tour operators that may not have access to, to the information. So we've joined the GSDC, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. Um, we've joined EarthCheck, and we're looking at the different options on how we can then take that as a bit of a qualified process for our industry. So it's a measured approach. Um, we're, we're coordinating a lot of the activity that's already there um, and making sure we put it under a bit of a banner that then gives us a tool to be able to meaningfully say in our marketing that we are sustainable, and that is culturally sustainable, economically, and environmentally. Uh, so since we have compared rail travel with air travel and Fiji is an island, what about the comparison with traveling by water? Yeah, I mean for us, um, cruise tourism isn't as big as it is for, for other destinations. Um, we have smaller uh, locally owned cruise operators within Fiji, which doesn't quite have the same footprint as the large ones. Um, we do have cruises that come in trans-Pacific. Um, we don't necessarily have the in and out. Um, that some of the other island destinations do have. Um, we are actively um, looking to develop our cruise sector, more so in that expedition cruise, uh, which tend to be very sustainable vessels. Um, some of the operators that we're talking to will be visiting um, areas of Fiji that don't really have uh, the opportunity to benefit from tourism in the same way that some of our main centers do. So, so it, you know, there's, there's trade-offs in some scenarios, but cruise for us remains relatively small. Okay. Okay. Now, coming to Mr. Sanjeev, sir. In India, you know, uh, how can this industry in particular create more job opportunities uh, in order to create livelihood for the local communities? Yeah, I think uh, tourism is one of the important sectors which is contributing all 17 sustainable development goals. And I think uh, all the countries are doing well in terms of the sustainability, uh, sustainability in the tourism sector. And I think India is the trend setter because the last G20 summit in India. So tourism has been given emphasis from sustainability front. At the same time, the Minister of Tourism Government of India has also come with the sustainable uh, tourism guidelines in place. And there are many uh, such sustainable tourism practices and responsible tourism approach actually has been adopted by many of the uh, communities and industries and civil societies. Uh, the ecosystem is actually just growing in India, particularly if I just take the example of uh, Kerala Responsible Tourism Mission and Madhya Pradesh Tourism uh, Board. So they are actually doing extremely well. Uh, in where in Madhya Pradesh we are one of the partners to promote the responsible rural tourism and responsible souvenirs and the, also the uh, homestays in the ground. 
So he is actually giving a space to the community and the important stakeholders at the destination to manage, operate and actually demonstrate the sustainable practices in the field. And coming to your question, the industry's role, I think uh, industry's role is actually very, very vital for me because uh, they are the players which can actually easily demonstrate and templatize the whole responsible tourism practices. Basically, the need of the hour is to just change the narrative of sustainable tourism practices in the country like India, because it's a vast country, uh, to set the whole sustainability in place in the tourism destinations. Uh, I think uh, the transformative uh, partnership is actually the key, where the civil societies who are actually uh, play and catalyst to support, facilitate and change the mindset of the host community and also the future travelers. It is important to have both the travelers and host community to be conscious about the responsible tourism practices where the industry can play an important role because industry is actually the interface between the travelers at the same time with the host community. Only they can actually facilitate and also part of the whole ecosystem just to diversify various responsible tourism practices and products in place. Uh, so be it uh, the culinary or culture or the local food systems and also the practices in place. So that will actually lead the whole systems in place. That will actually monetize in a way that the travelers will actually pay back to the society in terms of uh, following the responsible tourism practices. Definitely, sir. We need partnership and everything needs to go hand in hand. We need to be collaborating in this particular effort, especially in terms of sustainable tourism. Yeah, I just uh, want to mention, uh, because uh, being a part of uh, International Centre for Responsible Tourism in India chapter, what we are doing, we are just collaborating with all the practitioners and intellectuals and government and private bodies who are actually demonstrate the responsible tourism practices, we just created the network of knowledge exchange and knowledge building and also supporting the responsible tourism practices in place. Definitely. Uh, now coming back to the next set of questions that I have. What about the times when the need for sustainability comes at the expense of local communities livelihood? I would like to ask all of you guys to answer this question. We can start with Mr. I would like to first, I mean, talk about the aviation sector because Maldives fully depend on connectivity through aviation currently. But we also welcome cruise lines, which is a growing industry in the Maldives. And when it comes to aviation connectivity, I think there are methods to offset carbon. Currently. There are a lot of technologies, so we are also exploring those. And I would also like to highlight very recently in the COP summit, our president highlighted about a very promising project which is ongoing called Fushimada, which is for local uh, housing and etc. because housing is the major issue in Maldives. So I am going back to your question. Local community have been missing their housing while the tourism developed so much in the Maldives. So uh, we have a promising project called Fushimada, which is going to be most probably the, a zero carbon city. I think uh, that is I, uh, the first time a uh, special city is built with zero carbon, which will also create a huge attraction in Maldives. Also, a few weeks back, President also announced about uh, connectivity between the main island, Mahale, which is one of the densely populated capital island in the world, uh, through a tunnel, which is also an electric train system with a glass-like uh, feature, which will uh, again be like, uh, what, what do we say, uh, like an aquarium kind of thing, where you connect directly to Fushimade. So those are the projects. And again, when we talk about tourism in the Maldives, we have maintained sustainability, but I believe we have to also keep our culture and etc. within the uh, developments. So there is a lot of developments going on, like introducing cultural tourism. Maldives is very much connected culturally to the globe. For example, if you look at India, we are very much connected in terms of cuisine, etc. There are ways where, for, uh, there are, I mean, in the, India is like the dominating market for Maldives in terms of numbers. So we are trying to, 
I mean, come up with experiences that will attract more Indians. For example, in terms, uh, there is a major issue when it when it comes to I mean, Indian travelers to Maldives. We don't have enough vegetarian restaurants. So there are things that we are exploring that we can multiply Indian cuisine plus Maldives on a way that we can offer more experiences, which will and other experiences as well, which will connect our culture and people's mentality. And when it comes to Maldives, it's all about people, actually. If you ask a repeater, it's, they are not going just for sun, sand, and beach. They are going because they want to meet the person who took them to, for example, snorkeling. So every minute you spend in Maldives is very special because of the people's hospitality. So already we maintain it and we want to continue maintaining it without mixing up with other cultures, along with them. Definitely. Uh, it looks like a very promising project, especially the whole electric uh, train and the tunnel that's going to be like an aquarium. And being a vegetarian, I'm really looking forward to the dishes that you're going to be coming up. You always welcome. Like, um. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I'll ask you the same question here. Yeah. It's interesting hearing all this chatter about train travel because Bhutan doesn't have any tunnels nor trains. <laughs> so I feel like there's an opportunity there in the future. Yeah, not yet. Uh, but to answer your question, um, I think it's just about the way you, you look at sustainability and what that means. I think people have this concept that sustainability can be very expensive and it's a cost. Actually, it can be an opportunity and it can be a big benefit, right? Waste to wealth, you can turn waste into wealth. And it's really about looking at every part of your customer journey, of the tourism footprint, and thinking, how can we make this more sustainable without, yes, there might be upfront costs, but long term, there actually could be considerable savings. So as the Tourism Board of Bhutan, what we're doing, for instance, is um, introducing new standards for hotels that will come out this year. So we'll have new rating standards, that, and a large part of those will be all around sustainability. So for hotels to get certified and to have their, their rating system, they will have to embrace new um, sustainability standards. And it's just about kind of encouraging people to think about every part of their operation and how can it be more sustainable. The same thing for tour operators. Our association of Bhutanese tour operators is working closely with um, an organization called SUSTUR, and they're trying to introduce new green standards in the tour operator you know, industry, which is fantastic. And it's really making the tour operators think, how can I make my operation more sustainable? How can this have a more positive impact on the guest? So actually, yes, sustainability doesn't have to be expensive. It's just about coming up with new creative ways to make it, first of all, benefit the guest. It has to benefit the guest. It, you, know, you can't do sustainability just for the sake of it because I think that's, um, it's not going to sustain in the long term. It has to have, you know, I guess, impact, but it doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah, um, let me answer maybe in, in two perspectives. On our company, what we can contribute, we are actually a tech scale-up. We are a tech company, so we are investing all our million of euros into technology to improve it and to make it easier for the travel world to sell actually train tickets. So to really bring people into the public transport system who are not traveling by train or by any other public transport mode today. This is, this is our part we can, we can contribute to. Looking on the European rail industry, there's so much ongoing, eh? as I said already, um, before, so the targets are really, really ambitious, yeah? and the European Union um, wants to have a double number in the next 10 years in public transport on trains. This means a lot. We see um, liberalized markets. We see more competitors. Yeah, take 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 Italy or Spain as an example. Between Milan and Rome, between Barcelona and Madrid, you do have different operators today competing in high speed against each other. What is great. Yeah, because at the end, competition leads to a better product, um, a more sustainable product with even cheaper prices. Yeah, and and um, we are, let's say, a neutral and agnostic, a fully private player, which really compares every offer to each other and, and really gives the best offer to the customer. And maybe one example where you can see where, where investments in infrastructure and running so really lead to a change. So I guess everyone knows when you fly into London, you can take the Eurostar through the Eurotunnel to Paris. 
And back mid of the 90s, we had almost 400 flights a day, a day between London and Paris, 400 flights. Today, we have still 150 flights, a lot, but you have um, 250 flights less than um, 25 years back. So, and if you look on other connections on the, on, um, on the global landscape, it's, I would say, the opposite. Yeah? You have today more flights than it was 1995. So, yes, it was a heavy investment into this tunnel, into the Eurostar rolling stock, etc. But it's a bit chicken egg, yeah? And if you have those offers, and, 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 and if you emphasize people that it's, it's at the end, it's even faster, because you can travel from city center to city center, you do not need to fly from Heathrow to Charles de Gaulle, what's usually a nightmare, to be very honest. Yeah, um, so, and you have different examples like this, and, and I guess it's exactly um, what you said, yeah, and it needs to be attractive at the end, because we know, as I said, specifically in Europe, everyone is talking about sustainability, but when it comes to the criteria why someone is choosing a specific mode of transport, the first three criteria remain the same. Huh? It's safety, price, and time. That's it. And sustainability is number six. If you ask people on the street, everyone would say, of course, sustainability. Yeah? And we love to have people re who really um, ch um, uh, choose the train for sustainable reasons. That's perfect. But we know that we can only be more sustainable as a mobility industry when we increase the convenience and reduce the complexity. Yeah, I think um, I think for us, it's a continuation from from my colleagues here. Um, we uh, think of it in cost necessarily isn't, isn't sort of how we approach it. Supply chain that exists because, for example, um, the six sensors built uh, their rooms fully solar, um, and and what happens in that situation in an island country like ours is the supply chain that exists, and we now have villages that have. Um, solar-powered homes, as opposed to using a diesel generator, for example. So, I think you know, in, in some situations, there is cost, and, and from a tourist perspective, um, sustainability is a is a very very key talking point in terms of that decision making process and feeling as though they are, are making a difference when they take that trip that they want to take. In the actual final decision, and, and when it comes down to price differential, sometimes and for, not for all, but for some. If it is slightly more expensive because of the sustainable aspect, they will opt for something else. You know, we are a volume from certain countries, and it's in those countries that we see that the the um, need for sustainability and the, the safety in their mind of having the sustainable practice there is one thing. But then paying the additional money for some of the properties that are fully sustainable, or fully you know, um, uh, zero carbon footprint, may or may not be the case. But we, we're seeing that that is changing and it is becoming. More. Yeah, I think uh, sustainability and uh, the local livelihoods are actually interconnected. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. it is expensive for the other uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. If I just put the data of WCCI in 2022, this tourism uh, has been 7.6. So tourism has contributed 7.6% in the global GDP, uh, which has created uh, 22 million uh, new jobs in 2022, which is actually 22% growth over the last year. So what it says, basically it says the tourism is like a fire. And uh, when it comes to the topic of the sustainable tourism or the responsible tourism practices, it needs a lot of uh, criteria, but uh, I also agree with Vian about the sustainability criteria in the term, uh, tourism destinations in place, even if the whole travel uh, value chain, if whether the food we sourced and used for the uh, destination, or the energy we consume or the source, even if the water we use, even the uh, garbage management in practice. So all together, if we just put all the criteria differently, the, it is not affordable to the common man. It needs the needs market to play an important role. But when different partnerships come to the place and actually create an ecosystem that, yes, if we are going to experience the destination, 
we have failed. So that is standard we need to put in place. So that will actually ensure uh, the local community's interest at the same time sustainable uh, local economy uh, while considering the environmental and social capital even in the political way at the ground. So I think uh, that needs a transformation in the thinking process and also the travelers who are visiting uh, to whether they are conscious about a mindful travel. So the, the good thing is the travelers actually right now very conscious while visiting to a place. Uh, for example, booking.com is having their sustainable benchmarks in the, uh, while they are organizing the yes. tourism uh, in different destinations across the globe. So there, there are many initiatives that have been taken place. Only we need to fix the benchmark so that everyone should not compromise at the cost of anything. So that will actually create sustainable practices where the local stakeholders and communities who are actually owning it and that will create that transparency in place and definitely that will lead towards the sustainability. tourism to protect and preserve ecosystems, they have two things. They have two responsibilities. Um, the first one is to promote, read, like, meaning raise awareness of the issue of the, you know, the fragile um, ecosystem or the endangered animal, so the promotion of it and to protect it. So under the protection umbrella, there really should be some kind of mechanism for some benefit of tourism to go back into protecting or preserving this fragile ecosystem. So it's one thing to kind of get a lot of people there and to see the melting glaciers. But then if there's no mechanism to actually do anything to help or to, you know, to address this problem, then how is tourism helping away from the promotion part? So really it's both protect and promote. The destinations first. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, similar to, to my colleagues from, uh, from the Maldives, we do get a lot of attention. Uh, we sit in an ocean where some of our neighbors are um, predicted not to exist as a country in, in, the, in our lifetimes, which is quite dramatic. 
Um, I think that uh, in terms of protecting the ecosystem, if we talk about some of the operators, I mentioned earlier that we've had a lot of people and a lot of businesses and a lot of operators that have been in this space for a long time before we came in with coordinating. Um, we've got a number of NGOs that have been working really closely with our local communities as well as where they generally work. So uh, in Fiji, most of the land is still owned by the indigenous people and is kept in a trust. Um, and so, for example, if we have the Intercontinental Hotel, the village that is about 100 meters away owns the land that it sits on and supplies a vast majority of their workforce. In the processes that the Intercontinental Hotel, for example, they all, they all have different programs, educates them in, they then get an appreciation. And so I think that education is a, is a big part of them taking that away and, and helping to preserve the ecosystem that surrounds. Um, that is very sensitive and is changing because of temperature changes, whether you believe them or not. Um, but aside from that, there's a number of organizations that have come in. We have the Coral Gardeners, it's just over, which is one of three uh, coral replanting organizations. They essentially have done a lot of research over the last 10 years, and, and Morgan has been involved in this as well. Coral that um, can withstand warmer temperatures. So coral bleaching, for example, that we see in some places now is being counteracted by coral that can withstand higher temperatures, therefore doesn't bleach. In the process of that, it is an excursion for the tourists that are, that particular operator is based at the Six Senses in Fiji. You go along and you learn to plant and you understand what the coral is, and I think when they leave and they take that away, there is the education process, but also they are contributing to saving the ecosystem. And at the same time, there's a number of locals that are involved in training, etc., who then create offshoots, which is happening now. So I think, you know, tourism does play a big role in a country like Fiji because we don't often have the resource as a government, as a, as a people, to be able to do these things themselves. So tourism is the facilitator for a lot of that. Yeah, actually, uh, I think uh, tourism uh, is a vehicle to uh, promote, support, and preserve the ecosystems. Uh, in India, actually, we have demonstrated in uh, the coastal uh, state Odisha. Uh, it's a community-based ecotourism model we established last 13 years back. But it's a long story, more than two decades, because the village is a part of uh, the Chilika Lagoon, Asia's largest brackish water lagoon. So most of the uh, community are the traditional the fishermen community. So the village is having a fantastic uh, wetland of 15 square kilometers where the resident birds as well as the winter migrants congregate every year. So once upon a time, the villagers were engaged in poaching the birds and selling in the market and also consumption workers. The whole ecosystem was damaged. But when we entered into the place, and uh, we tried how best we can contribute to conserve the ecosystem. But it's a long conversation, consultation, people's mentality, because it was a lucrative income for them. But when uh, we actually started community-based ecotourism in 2010, uh, it was, the village was not in the map. But it is now a transformation where, if you Google it, Mangala Jodi ecotourism, you'll have a series of uh, links in the Google. So the normal village has been converted as an ecotourism village where we put a lot of capacity building support, consultation in changing the mindset, create incentive model to start livelihoods through ecotourism means. And over the period actually it has been established in such a way where the community uh, conserves the wetland, it's burned. There is zero poaching in the 15 square kilometer, about 1,500 square, uh, acre, hectares of land has been preserved. The whole ecosystem has been restored. And the community has been directly involved in offering various tourism services that includes the community stay, the local food, uh, keeping the uh, tourist into the guided bar watching on the wetland. In the full package of products and services we have established uh, year after year, and finally, even uh, the highest uh, body, even WTO recognized us uh, for innovations in enterprise model. We just went uh, and uh, actually uh, celebrate in Madrid. So that is the power of tourism, which is actually uh, preserving the ecosystem. So I think there are many such examples across the country is actually preserving. Only thing is how to escalate those kind of practices and models uh, to a scaling of level. 
I see, I see maybe three, three things. First is that we really need to um, co collaborate as an industry very, very intensively. Yeah? So it, it, for me, we are not independent coming from destination to hospitality, hospitality to mobility. Yeah? This needs to be, at, at the end, it's one chain. And um, we can only increase the sustainable factor when we really um, look at it as an, as an entire chain first. Second, second is, I guess we need to be realistic. Huh? So specifically in Europe, maybe we were a bit naive. During COVID, everyone was expecting, oh, we are traveling less and we are commuting less, etc., etc. Maybe commuting a bit because you can do more remote work. But at the end, we see we are 20, 25% above 2019 in all the mobility numbers in Europe, even in air travel. Huh? even in air So we need to face the reality, and at the end, it's, it's on us to change patterns. Yeah? And, and this is out of the comfort zone, yeah? specifically um, when it comes to when it comes to day-to-day -to -day travel. And third is, I guess, all the developments around the globe, specifically here in India, have also a lot yeah? when it comes to, to tourism, when it comes to how I travel in Europe, because we see heavy investments here. So many good examples also in rail travel, when I, when I compare India to 10 years back. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Infrastructure um, offers, rolling stock, etc. cetera. Um, further needs for investment into technology. So I tried every local train in Mumbai the, the last days. Um, I traveled last year 75,000 kilometers in trains actually, and I love to be in trains and to see the differences. So I was queuing at the ticket machine, for instance, in Mumbai before I recognized, okay, I cannot pay with my credit card. So in 20 minutes we're gone. So, and you see the barriers are high, but all the developments, all the really heavy investments, um, states um, and countries, and, and specifically also carriers are doing at the moment, will help on a global landscape. Huh? And, and I'm very positive that even with increasing mobility numbers, we will travel more sustainably in future. Just to add on, uh, actually, when we say the conservation of the ecosystem through tourism, so it is very, very important to assess the uh, whole carrying capacity of that destination. Uh, because what we experienced when we started that uh, community-based ecotourism in 2010, but when we realized that it has been going to be a popular destination and government of Odisha already declared as a eco destination, so the uh, inflow of the tourists actually uh, increasing day after year. But when we realized that fact that to reduce the over tourism, we did a carry capacity assessment the basis on that some regulatory framework actually we are working currently to set up there to self-regulation will actually help to fix the carrying capacity of those destinations to make sure that the tourism is going to be sustainable. Definitely. And uh, now that we have come to the end of this discussion, a little over time, but it's okay, because a lot of perspectives, specifically I think the one where we were sort of able to conclude that sustainability and tourism can go hand in hand. It's actually facilitating the process and uh, the education of it can be leading to a lot of employment as well. So I think it was a very enriching discussion. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, before we wrap up, I would be requesting the mementos to come over here and uh, I will be giving you them. And after that, we would be uh, coming to Sanjeev sir and he will be introducing us a little bit, not introducing, but talking a bit more about ICRT Foundation and the partnership that OTM has had with it. And we will be watching a video as well. So, yes, yes sir. So I'll just request the mementos to come on, brought on stage, please. All right, so that will be done later on. We can come to the ICRT Foundation uh, First, sir, please take note. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, International Center for Responsible Tourism actually started by uh, Professor Goodwin uh, uh, in London uh, more than 20 years back. Uh, so that is basically just to promote, support the responsible tourism practices across the globe. But if, uh, by connecting with those kind of responsible tourism practices in India, actually, we have started and founded the ICRT Foundation. It's a uh, part uh, network of tourism, responsible tourism practitioners, where different <laughs> practitioners, industry bodies, as well as the tourism bodies like 
Kerala Responsible Tourism Mission, Madhya Pradesh Responsible Tourism Mission, they also uh, collaborated with us. And we have uh, membership-based uh, community in the country where we actually create ecosystem to help support the practitioners at the ground, at the same time to support the government bodies to promote support and actually leverage the responsible tourism mission in a uh, mission mode. Currently, the Maharashtra government is also actually pushing for the sustainable tourism practices. So they have also had an agreement with ICRT uh, in past. And uh, uh, we have actually partnership with Fairfest, uh, uh, with ICRT. And last year, actually, we have initiated the regional award. And the award ceremony actually happened in New Delhi uh, during the last TTF. And uh, I'll just... Uh, uh, request the organizer to just put one of our uh, ICRT members, just uh, have a one minute video just to see sharing about the ICRT Foundation's award. Just we have just opened in first of the February. So the award is an annual event, so we have five, six categories, which is across the responsible tourism practices. So the nominations from the ground level actually just encourage, celebrate the practices so that that will motivate and inspire the other. Uh, to actually follow the path of responsible tourism. Thank you. Sanjin, can you just uh, contribute anything? Just. Um, it's just a minute. Sanjin is coming here. <laughs> yeah, it's Sanjin's job. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So I'm Sandrine Clarek. I'm the director of marketing for Fairfest Media. It's a great pleasure to have you uh, on our uh, speakers today. So just to give a few words about ICRT, our uh, partnership and collaboration dates back for many years now. Uh, it's a great pride for Fairfest Media and for our chairman and uh, co-founder, Mr. Sanjay Bhagavan, who's very active with the uh, communities being in Uttarakhand, in Himachal Pradesh, and many other states, uh, to have ICRT as our partners. Uh, in BLTM in Delhi, we announced the awards uh, in last September, along with them, so many winners uh, of, um, you know, of companies who are acting on the field. And again, this year, we're pleased to announce the awards dates and nomination uh, for this year now onwards and uh, again we'll give the uh, the winners uh, at the upcoming BLTM on 29, 30 and 1st of, uh, 1st of September. So thank you so much.